when we look at the swirl of events the last couple of days, raging debate in the United Kingdom, we've got Bernanke moving the markets. Is there stability there or is there a real growth slowdown? Well, there is a growth slowdown, but that should not be any surprise. The two factors that have driven the world economy in the last two years, and the world is in recovery, the two factors that have driven the recovery are now unwinding. One of those factors has been the policy easing in the West, and the second factor has been the growth of the emerging economies, but particularly Asia. And Asia is slowing down, not collapsing, just slowing because of all the policy tightening that's taken place in recent months. So the two factors that have driven the world are now so offsetting one another, shall we say, going into reverse. So we're getting a slowdown, not a collapse. It's a gentler pace of global growth. I want to start with a set of ideas. Let's go to a long-term view. Bring it up here, uh, if you would, uh, Rex. This is a remarkable chart. This is synthetic euro. It's a Deutschmark before the euro. Yeah. And there it is over... <laughs> Excuse me, over three. I've been choking on the, the biscuits you have here. Okay. I'm like on ten, ten like things of Walker shortbread biscuits so there it is um and it's a, it's a, this the the long-term rise euro strength up we go again how high does it begin to pain europe well it's already paining europe basically we have a very divided global economy the east is in much better shape than the west in america big firms are in better shape than small firms but in europe there's a big division between the core and the periphery so even without any appreciation of the euro the periphery Greece, Portugal, Spain and Ireland are in deep recession. So any further strengthening of the euro starts to not only put the boot in for those, but starts to make life difficult for the Germans as well. My viewers in the United States are saying, Tom, Greece, Portugal, Greece, Portugal, Ireland, Greece, yeah. Portugal, enough. Help us here. Is this time different? Is there something new in this conversation versus three months ago or nine months ago? No, it's the same problem. But basically, the continentals, those in the Eurozone, don't want to bite the bullet. For this whole thing to survive, the core, the wealthy countries, the Germans, need to give more help to the periphery, to the Portugal's, Italy's, Ireland's, Greece's and Spain, shall we say. Um, basically, they don't want to do that. So we keep muddling through. So we keep having the repetition of the worries every three or four, five months. At some stage, we're going to come to a sort of tipping point. Either the core decides to really bail out the periphery or the periphery then has to accept they're not going to be bailed out. They're going to not only face a deep recession, but they've got to actually take even more pain. And then that's really the crux point, which is why Trichet, the head of the European Central Bank last week, started to talk about Europe needing a central treasury. For this whole thing to survive, in terms of America, think right. of it like the states. You have poor states and you have wealthy states, but the whole thing binds together because it's one country. The Washingtons and the New Yorks maybe will bail out some of the poorer states of the Union. In Europe, you don't have a political union. So what we have is a sort of compromise situation. I was watching Ken Burns' Civil War video of the okay. United States Civil War, and they talk about, Shelby Foote talks about the language chaining from the United States are to the United States is. Would you suggest that the European Union are? They're yeah. not to an is state yet, Actually are they? Not. I was at a sort of closed door event in Europe about a month or so ago, but I'm not going to give any secrets away, but let's put it this way. The guys at the centre, the Germans and the people in the core, were saying we are in an economic and monetary union, EMU. They've, they were saying that the monetary union part works well, the European Central mm -hmm. Bank. They were saying the economic part hasn't worked. And what that means, in other words, is basically Greece needs to become like Germany overnight. It needs to take pain. It needs to become competitive. Is that possible? Do you not, see that? No. It's not credible either economically or politically. That's why this mess in the Eurozone continues. And coming back to your question about the markets, that's why any strengthening of the Euro is a problem. But one can look at it a different mm -hmm. way and say that the periphery, whilst they're important, right. they don't count for the big part of the European economy. The big part of the European economy, outside the UK, obviously, the Eurozone, it's the Germans, the French. The German economy is benefiting a lot from China. What's probably of equal concern in Germany at the moment is not just Greece, it's the slowdown in the Chinese economy as well. Mm -hmm. Let's bring up the yen. I want to go around the world here. We've got so much to talk about with Gerard uh, Lyons. It is the yen. It's the Eisen level. I Kid Sarah Eisen okay. from our New York uh, 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 shop about uh, 80 being a big deal. Well, we've gone through 80. Um, talk about game theory. Bernanke speaks because Diamond speaks. It affects Europe. It affects Japan. There is a huge interdependency yeah. of the economy. Are they going to intervene again? 
Um, quite possibly, but Japanese industry can actually cope with the strong yen far better than most people realise. Japan is in a very difficult situation because the economy isn't in, if you believe the government, going to stabilise until September when all the problems after this tsunami start to be sorted out. So they probably don't want a much stronger yen, so they could intervene <coughs> if it looks like it's going to appreciate aggressively. If right. it's sort of small moves, they're not going to do too much. Big problem in Japan is still the whole nuclear fallout. That still hasn't, in my mind, been fully cleared from people's What's minds. What's your latest reading on that? I'm out of touch on that. Well, the official line is that things are improving, but if you talk to people closer to the action, um, Tokyo is still slightly dark. They're having to be very careful about use of energy. They're coming up to the energy peak period in the hot summer. But on top of that, there are worries that the organ basically the regulators who control nuclear, the people who run nuclear, are all from the same university, taught by the same professor, all come out of the same school of thought. And they didn't believe this could mm. go wrong. So there is still a fear in Japan that a worst case scenario could yet materialize. But mm -hmm. hopefully for our sake as well as theirs, that the right. government is right, that the situation is stabilizing. But in terms of the yen, yes, clearly given what's happening globally, it's possible that the safe haven for the Japanese will be to keep their money at home. That keeps the currency well underpinned. Right. Maybe the currency we should talk about is China, because in our well, view, there's a possibility the Chinese might allow their widening of their band against the dollar in the next few weeks. Wait, I'm in charge of the show. Gerard Lyons is making up the script here. What's that about? Gerard Lyons with us, folks, from the Standard Charter Bank. We're going to run through some notes here and op-eds that I think that you can't imagine the debate over here about austerity. It is everywhere. Here's Gerard Lyons. Let's bring up this note here across our beautiful floor uh, in uh, London. For now, the U.S. is no longer the world's growth engine. The mantle has passed to China, with the West struggling to reduce debt. Asia matters more than ever. I understand that. That's been your theme for two years. But will China slow down? Yeah, China will have a temporary slowdown. The Chinese authorities have been tightening monetary policy since last September, really. Mm -hmm. um, what's quite remarkable is the speed at which that tightening has fed through into the economy. Now, it could, could be the case that China was about to slow down anyway, but certainly tightening loan quotas has slowed the economy quite significantly. The Chinese want a s sort of soft landing, a sort of more sustainable pace of growth. If they get too hard a landing, the positive news is that China still has ample fiscal reserves, so they can always pump prime they the economy. They showed that at the beginning of the crisis, didn't yeah. they? But the actually interesting thing, in China, the mood is quite positive. I was out there a few weeks ago, and they announced their 12th five-year plan a few months ago. And in layman's terms, I would say the 12th five-year plan is to move China up the value curve. They re realize they can no longer go on selling cheap goods to Westerners <clears throat> up to their eyeballs in debt. So it's boosting consumption, social spending, and the green economy. China doesn't have to worry about political courage. Here's an op-ed yeah. I showed uh, Julian Jessup of Capital Economics earlier. Bring it up here. Uh, Alice Cena from May of 2010. It is possible for fiscally responsible governments to engage in large fiscal adjustments and survive politically. Moreover, acting on the spending side is no more costly than doing on the tax side, which is better given austerity, whether it's U.S. or U.K. Should we cut spending or do we do it through tax, uh, increased tax receipts? Well, it depends what you cut. If you cut the things that don't matter, the, where there's the fat, right. then that's easier to do. If you start to raise taxes, then it can undermine competitiveness. In terms of fiscal policy, there's a few rules. The f rule one is that you should run a surplus in the good time. We didn't, a lot of do people that. didn't We didn't do that here either. Rule two and rule three are equally important. Rule two is that you need a credible medium-term plan to bring the deficit down. Britain has that. Greece clearly doesn't. The third rule is that whatever you're doing on fiscal policy, whether it's cutting spending or raising taxes, the central bank has to and must keep interest rates as low as possible for as long With as Chairman possible. Chairman Bernanke's doing, and doing invoicing. That. Now, with the U.S. economy slowing, that lessens any likelihood, even if it did exist before, of the Fed tightening. What it also is likely to do is delay, maybe by one or two years, any fiscal tightening mm -hmm. in the States. Because beyond those three key rules I mentioned, beyond that, it's a judgment call. The speed and the scale at which you cut a fiscal deficit depends on your judgment call. Ideally, yeah, you should judgment, wait. Yeah. yeah, ideally, though, you should wait till the private sector is strong enough to cope. I want to get up this op-ed here and squeeze this in, if we could, uh, Dr. Lyons. Bring up here Peter Orzag, Bloomberg View. This is must read. Orzag, of course, with the Obama administration a, a number of quarters ago. The polarization that results 
from a piper partisan view uh, or structure, I should say, makes our political system, which is never particularly good at dealing with any problems before it, suffer even more inertia. Yeah, I, I think what's, the, what's the inertia in the United Kingdom right now? Well, actually, I think that's a load of nonsense, quite frankly. Basically, you need a clear vision. You need exclusive. To, yeah. Lions, says Orzog, a load of nonsense. Well, what Go. you said there, basically, you need a clear vision. People need to understand why there's pain. There's many examples, even though governments tend to lose popularity if they hear fiscal austerity, if people understand the context, if they think it's fairly done and they believe there's light at the end of the tunnel, people can bear it. So you need a clear, articulate vision as to why you're doing it and why the economy can come out stronger, not weaker. Great to see you. Thank you so much for coming in. Gerard Lyons, folks, the Standard Charter Bank.